Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you never fail and you won't start now. Welcome to worship this morning at Grace Covenant. We are glad to have you with us, whether you are worshiping in person or worshiping with us at home. We are glad to see you. Mitch said that we want to extend our sympathy to all of the Kansas fans who are mourning yesterday. But as Mitch, but as Miles noted this morning, we have a, a cat fight to look forward to with the Wildcats versus the Wildcats. So lots of fun coming up for us. This morning, as we were before to prepare to worship, I want to remind those of you who are at home uh, or even in the, in the worship, there is a QR code in the bulletin, and we ask you to let us know that you are with us this morning, worshiping with us. Um, now in these days of hybrid worship, it's kind of a mystery who is with us and who isn't online. So we'd love to have you sign in. If you are with us in person, there are um, attendance, the paper kind, 
at the end of the pew in the center aisle, if you would get that and fill those in for us. We appreciate knowing who is here. And back in the old days, before COVID, it used to help us kind of keep track of who's here and who's not and who may need us to reach out and lend them a hand. So we ask you to go ahead and do that. This morning, as we prepare for worship, I want to talk a little bit about the season of Lent and what it represents. I had some questions this week about the pyramids. Pyramids are the claws that are up here on the pulpit and the communion table. So I asked my daughter to help me design a set of pyramids that represents Lent that isn't the cross and isn't crowns of thorns and nails. Because I believe those things are Holy Week. But the season of Lent has an entirely different purpose than just to send us to Holy Week. So I would say if you look at these pyramids and were to read Psalm 51, I think that is one of the most beautiful psalms that captures the spirit of what happens during the season of Lent. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, Take your whole, not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me. That's what happens during the season of Lent. It's a time of close reflection, a time also of letting go. So when you look at these symbols, someone asks, what does this represent? This season, this year, Mitch and I have really been focusing in on a sermon series that talks about the things that God might like us to give up for Lent. So in these images of these swirling, moving pieces, you might see a symbol of cleansing, or you might see a symbol of letting go. Same with a lectern cloth. This one, these were made actually for for an ordination and installation of an educator who had completed her education exams. And the symbol in the middle represents two things. Anybody guess what they are? One is baptism. Looks like a bowl of water. The other, if you look at the hands holding the bowl, could look like a chalice, the sacrament of communion. So both of the sacraments are represented. This is a frontal. If you want really technical language, this on the, on the communion table is called a frontal, and these are pyramids. So with that in mind... Please enjoy them. May they draw you into our worship this morning as we worship together on this fourth Sunday in the season of Lent. It's going quickly. Let us worship. Turn in your bulletin, if you will, to the call to worship, and if you are able in body or in spirit, you may stand and join me as we pray together. When we stand at the edge of fear and worry... When we stand at the edge of the world's pain, Jesus invites us to step into the land of humble service. When we stand at the edge of hunger and thirst, the Spirit invites us to step into the world with food and drink. Holy God, we have gathered in your house to worship and learn of your ways. Teach us by your word and fill us with your Spirit that we may go out sharing your great love with all our neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen. You live among the least of these, the weary and the weak. And we Meet the 
children to come forward and if we have any older children or youth who would like to come and join them we could probably use an extra hand this morning is a noisy offering so Mitch if you'll pass out cans we'll put everybody together with a partner preferably one older one younger how about that okay one older one younger As we are getting our cans, we'll tell you a little bit about the, the Presbyterian Mission Agency, which is where this offering is going to go. PMA is one of the offices of the General Assembly. It's really the program outlet. It's where all of our, our resources are, and uh, people who are working on different things, Matthew 25 comes out of the Presbyterian Mission Agency. Their work covers four ministry areas, compassion, peace, and justice, racial equity and women's intercultural ministries, theology formation and evangelism, world mission, and they do all of this work to inspire us, equip us, and connect all Presbyterians for the children's work. And if you really want to have some fun, you can use the language of Presbyterians. It, the, our offering is going to CP and J. Re, uh, oh, this is the one that's hard to say. There's REAC, and then there's Re we all of these lovely little uh, little vocabularies that we put together. So, how are we doing here? Does everybody have a can, a partner in a can? Okay, we're going to send some of you over to the outside. You're not done. There's cans rolling around on the floor up here. Oh, that was clever. Um, so we'll put some of you. You know what? Let's stay on the inside aisle. But we need some on that section. So I'm going to send Caitlin, who's your 
Who are your partners? Evie, Abby and Evie? Okay, I'm gonna send you back to row G to start. And then James, and you're gonna be on the, the left-hand side. James, if you will start at row D. Who's your partner, James? Liam? Liam? We're picking. This is like picking a basketball team. Who's got the best hoops? All right. And Hillary, you have, you have Drake. You're going to start at row B on the left-hand side. Then Mallory. Oh, you're on the right-hand side. Okay, Mallory, you're going to go to letter G on the left-hand side with Rowan. And then we need uh, to row D on this right side. And then I'm going to send you guys out to the sides. So, um, Strombergs, if you will do back where your parents are, this outer side. Start on row, do we have a number on it? A letter? No? Yes, yes, yes. Start on row D, guys. D. And work your way back. Um, you want to do that? That would be great. Okay, you're going to go on the inside. We're going to send you to the outside over on row D. Um, I don't know. Charlotte, I sent you to, to uh, B, right? Yeah, I think I sent you to B. So start here, but you can work your way back. Right here, and then right there. All right, guys. You are on the outside. On that side. So look over where Rebecca is. And look, Carrie's waiting for you. Does he not have a can? Give him a can. Max, take a can. Max gets the big can. As soon as Max comes back, we can all bring our cans up after you've collected, and we will pour them all into the can. Max has the big can. Max has the big can. Here he comes. Come on up, Max. All right, Max. Hang on. That's right. You're going to put your can right up here by Mitch. Awesome. I see one of our communion jars. Awesome. Okay, Caitlin, if you'll bring it up. It's going to get too heavy if we do that. But just put it up by, by Mitch, and then we can all come up and dump our cans. All right. Come and dump them up. Can I just leave your cans in that front pew? You're all done? In the front pew, in that box over there. Good job, everybody. Thanks to all our generous folks out there. And it just keeps coming. Awesome. All right. All right. As they are finishing up here, I do invite you this week to be praying for the Presbyterian Mission Agency and the Office of the General Assembly. Um, you may have heard that there was a vote at this summer's General Assembly to merge those two agencies into one. And this week they will be meeting for a full week of visioning and discussion about what that merger is going to look like. So PMA really needs our prayers as well as our support. So let's do that. All right, Mitch. Shall we pray? Let's. God, we hope that you'll use every bit that we give you, from the smallest coins to the biggest dollars, 
and use it in a way that can help people and help our church. We do this because all of us can share in the work of this church and the work of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh. Those going to ATW may head oh. down. The rest of you may go back with your parents. This is heavy. Thank you for your help. One of the ways that we move closer to that clean heart is by letting go of those things that separate us from one another and from God. And so that is what we do together as we pray our, call, our prayer of confession. It is both what we call a corporate prayer and a personal prayer, remembering that all of us together at times are also complicit in not doing what God calls us to do. So with that in mind, let us join together in our prayer of confession. We admit we are hesitant to walk to Jerusalem and beyond with you, God of glory, in a world where we worry about tomorrow before enjoying today. We race by your moments of silence, of learning. In that flood of worries, which can overwhelm us, we may miss that assurance that you have not cut us off from your grace. In the deserts of our desires, we may ignore that feast of hope, of joy, of life you offer to us. Forgive us and have mercy on us, gentle guardian of our souls. In humility, may we offer our lives to others. In love, may we share your grace with everyone we meet. In hope, may we wait for you all our days as you come to us in the life and joy of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I invite you to take a moment to pray silently. It is impossible for us to imagine the grace and mercy that comes from God. But Jesus has reminded us that God desires to restore us, to renew us, to forgive us. So remember, friends, that we are forgiven and be at peace. And may you share that peace with one another with a sign of peace, whether it's shaking hands, a hand over your heart, a peace sign. Share the peace with one another, saying, may the peace of Christ be with you.
upon my chest as I lie awake and wonder what the future will hold. Help me to remember that you're in control. You're my courage when I worry in the dead of night. You're my strength as I'm not strong enough to win this fight. You are greater than the battle raging in my mind. I will trust you, Lord. I will fear no from uh, first from the book of Philippians chapter 4 verses 6 to 7 do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus the second reading is from Romans Chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, you are without excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, are doing the very same thing. We know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with truth. say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some, and right now, oh right now I'm losing bad, stood in this spot time after time, reminding the broken it'll be alright, but right now, right now. I just can't It's easy to sing When there's nothing to bring me down But it was 
what will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am right now? I know you're able and I know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope's in you. say it only takes a little faith to move mountains well good thing a little faith is all i have right now but god when you choose to make mountains unmovable oh give me the strength to be able to sing it is well with my soul i know you're able and i know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand but even if you don't my hope is you alone i know the sorrow and i know the hurt what all second scripture comes from the gospel of Matthew. Jesus said to them, do not worry. Do not worry about the food you will eat or the clothes you will wear. Isn't life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap. They do not store away food. And yet, you, Father in heaven, feed them. And to God, you are much more valuable than the birds. Can worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field, they do not work to have the finest clothing. And yet, not even the richest man in history was clothed like one of these. This is how God dresses the grasses of the field. 
which are here today and gone tomorrow. If God gives such attention to these flowers, will he not take even greater care of you? Give all your attention to what God is doing right now, and he will take care of the rest. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks be to God. Nothing unusual. Email was down again. And uh, Bill called me into his office again. What's wrong? Nothing really. He just thinks he can come down and fit in with these blue collar guys. You know, he's white collar. He's or you've done something wrong again. And you're getting in trouble. And you'll get demoted. Then you'll stop shaving. There goes my vacation. Maybe you'll even get fired. And then you'll do that lazy thing and I'll have to go back to work. And there goes the house. We had plans for this house. We'll be living out of our car or out on the street, and eventually we'll be forced to move in with your mother. How was your day, Kim? Well, Dana's having a party Friday night, and I thought I could go. But before you freak out, it's not going to be that big of a deal. I mean, y'all guys know this. You're a great kid, but there's no stopping the peer pressure. It just takes one sip, and you're hooked. And then there's the smoking and the piercings and the tattoos. And the boys. Even good boys don't have good intentions, never mind the bad boys. Oh, and you'll go straight for one of the bad boys, and they'll introduce you to all the bad things, and you'll get pregnant and drop out of school, and we'll never see you again. And we'll be stuck with your kid. What about you, Mom? I've been considering taking up string art. No. Des has been doing some really wonderful things with it. You can do anything with string. Did you know you can make refrigerator magnets? Everyone knows string art is a gateway craft. You'll start knitting and making me hats and scarves and sweaters and making me wear those sweaters. And you'll stop dyeing your hair and get those grandma glasses and you'll want a cat, which will kill my allergies and probably lead to more cats. And you'll want to make things and bring it to my class and embarrass me in front of all of my friends. This a cat hair? <laughs> <laughs> so who are you? <laughs> I am so clearly the mom. I am trying to take up a string art. I'm trying to get my loom going and start doing some weaving. I am so much the mom. If one thing starts to go wrong, then I worry about what's next, and what's next, and what's next. And yet Jesus says, do not worry. This is one of the most difficult scriptures for us, I think, at least I, I think as it's been interpreted over the generations. It's difficult for anyone like me who struggles with anxiety. Worry is an issue for some people that isn't just mind games, but is also physical, is also chemical. So it's really difficult to stand before you and say, if you just have enough faith in God, God will take care of everything, so just don't worry. The reality is for some people that there are those who are one paycheck away from being homeless, losing their house. There are some people, especially in March now, as some of the SNAP benefits decrease, who are facing having even less food on the table for their families. There are some people who are receiving a diagnosis of an illness that has the potential to be terminal. How do you tell them not to worry? Some will interpret this scripture to say, well, if you just have enough faith, you won't have to be afraid and you won't have to worry. And I want to counter that. There are some congregations that will preach this text and say, 
Worry, fear, anxiety is sin. And if you do those things, you are not right with God. So you need to fix that relationship with God, and then you won't worry anymore. If that's the case, I should resign. Because I know how to worry with the best. So I want us to think about this text a little bit. But I want to put it in some context. And the first thing that I want us to think about is, I don't think Jesus meant, just don't have any worries don't be afraid. You don't need to have any anxiety. I've got it all under control. Now let's fast forward to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus worried. Jesus was so anxious, he was sweating drops of blood. Joel Ilton shared with us Thursday night that when you're in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, from where he was praying, would have likely been able to see the, row, the pile or the row of, of Roman soldiers with their torches burning on their way to take him. When he said, my hour is at hand, it wasn't just a mystery. It wasn't just God knowledge. He could see them coming for him and he sweat great drops of blood. There's a name for that. It's called hematohydrosis. It's a medical condition that occurs under extreme stress. Jesus worried. So I don't think Jesus was teaching us, oh, don't worry about anything, God's got it all under control, when he himself worried and asked God to take that cup from him that was about to come. So now we need to look at the second context that's important. You always need to look at where a text sits. This text sits in the Bible right after the Sermon on the Mount. And if you remember, we did a number of sermons on that in the last couple of months on the Sermon on the Mount. We worked our way through that, and we saw how Jesus was teaching this formula of what a righteous life looks like. It was very strong on the emphasis that to be godly is to care for those who are in need, those who have the least, those who are hungry, those who don't know how they will clothe themselves. And Jesus said, my followers will take care of those folks. This text comes after the Sermon on the Mount. He's with the disciples. They were probably pretty well challenged by that sermon and had some questions. And Jesus is wanting to teach them and to encourage them to hold on because what he has just laid out for them might have felt overwhelming for the disciples. Who am I to go out and teach people the way of righteousness? Who am I to be part of this thing that you are about, Jesus? I can't even begin to walk in your shoes. I'm afraid. And Jesus says, do not worry. God will take care of all of these things. But I want to suggest that Jesus said those things with the confidence that his disciples and all of his followers would do the things that he just taught them to do. I don't think Jesus had some kind of supernatural understanding that if you just have enough faith, all these things will be taken care of for you. Jesus knew better than that. He saw the well-being of the widow and the orphans in society who could be just left behind with no resources, no food, no clothing. He knew that that wasn't an issue of faith. Remember the story of the widow who all she had to bring was a what might for her offering and she brought this very least of offering and Jesus says she is the greatest in heaven because she had so little and yet she gave it. These were the people that were important to Jesus, so much so that he said, care for them. So I want to offer the thought that maybe what Jesus was doing here wasn't suggesting that you need to have blind faith, but that if all the pieces are in place of the kingdom that God desires, that Jesus has laid out for them, you will not have to worry for where you will sleep, for where you will live, for where you will eat and what you will eat, and what you will wear. That said, I do think that Jesus, as God with us, 
would have desired that we could figure out a way to let go of our fear and anxiety knowing it does bodily harm. We know from our psychologists and researchers of the brain the damage that long-term fear and anxiety can do to us physically. Conditions like arthritis, MS, all kinds of neurological diseases are impacted by stress and anxiety. Yeah. So trying to learn some ways to cope with that is powerful. <coughs> so what I'm going to share with you is there are times when I am so stressed, it's not easy to always be a pastor. My future hinges on you. My ability to feed my family is determined by whether you contribute to the church. It can be really stressful to go from year to year to year to year not knowing if I'm going to have a job next year. And that's true for all church staff. It's kind of the nature of the beast, especially in the days that we're living in. So there are times when I will wake up in the night <gasps> with a panic attack. Am I doing everything I can? How am I responsible for this? What are the things I need to do? Lord, am I really equipped to do this work? I, 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 and the cycle just spins and it spins, just like we saw in that nice little video. And so what I have learned to do is to follow the path that Jesus took when he was under stress in the garden. And he went off, he took some people who were his support system, his disciples with him, and then he went off alone to pray. He prayed that God would take this away from him. But he prayed that God help him, would help him to have the strength he needed, recognizing that this would be what God needed him to do. And so I pray. I pray with breath exercises. I breathe in, calling out to God, O oh, holy God, O oh, God of love, Oh, God of peace. And then I exhale. I need your help. What in the heck are you doing to me now? I'm really stressed. And one of the things that I have found is when I do this for a while, it may take some time. Um, I just sit in peace then after that. I don't offer my laundry list. God knows what's going on in my life. God knows what I need better than I do. I just lay there in peace. And time after time, I will wake up in the morning knowing that God has helped me to find peace and sleep. I don't think God desires for us to worry and be anxious because it is not good for us, not because it's a moral code, not because it's a sin. Good grief, our creator is the one who gave us the amygdala in our brain, that little reptile part that is the part that reacts because of our need to survive in a different time and place, and that's where that worry comes from. We are wired to worry. How could God then say, don't? What God needs us to do is to find peace, be still, and know that I am God. Psalm 46. Breathe in deeply. And then look for that support system. Where is your support system? Who are the people you can reach out to? Depending on what your need is, it may be a social organization, it may be a church, it may be a friend, and share with them and walk with each other. And then it is my solemn prayer that people will find what they need in the church a place where we come and in community worship God and recognize that we are God's people and God loves us mightily. I really believe that that's how Jesus would want us to handle stress. Seek God, personally and privately, corporately, and then be the kingdom of God he taught us to be so that no one has to fear for their next meal or where they will sleep or what they will wear. It's a partnership. God is not going to wave a magic wand and make things happen, but God calls on us to do the work. 
May we be the bringers of peace and calm and comfort to one another in the name of God's love. Amen. Now I invite you to pray with me. Most holy God, you have taught us to not be afraid. But we also know that fear is part of who we are and it is something that we struggle with. And so we pray that you will help us to find the pathways to peace that first begin with opening our hearts to you and being in your presence. O oh, holy God, we thank, thank you so much for the vision of the world that you have given us, a vision that is counter society but filled with love and peace. As we look at the world around us, there is not a lot of love, and we need peace. And so as we remember Mr. Rogers in the coming days, we remember that he says, look to those who are doing good to see where you are working. And so we pray for those who are putting their lives at risk to feed the people of Ukraine. The women who are willing to stand up to the systems in Iraq so that girls can be educated. The people who are coming from agencies around the world to provide food and clothing and care for those who have experienced earthquakes and fires and floods. We give thanks for them and may we promise to support them as well. Oh, holy God, we pray for your church. At times we forget that love is the thing that should be motivating us most. And we begin to set up systems and rules that become the requirements that are more important than showing your love and your grace and bringing peace. We pray, O oh Christ, that you will call our eyes to see what you have laid before us, the things that you have taught us to do, and help us to be more faithful to your calling. O oh holy God, there are so many people who are experiencing brokenness and pain and fear today. We remember those in our hearts who are close to us, those who are undergoing medical treatments and diagnoses, those who are experiencing brokenness in relationships and loss of loved ones. O oh, holy God, may we be messengers of love and peace for them with the love and peace that you inspire within us. O oh, holy God, help us to consider what it is to be your people and then empower us to be your people. Not people of fear, but people with the courage to step away from the fear and do your work. Amen. I do see we have a minute for mission in the bulletin. Do we have someone to do one this morning? I don't see anyone. We did our minute for mission, I think, for the noisy offering. As you bring your gifts this morning, remember that the gifts that you bring do more than pay the light bills and the utility bills. They empower us to do the work of Christ. And so give as you are able, but most of all, give with love in your heart. Line number one, you're supposed to have it all together. And when they ask how you're doing, just smile and tell them never better. Line number two, everybody's life is perfect except yours. So keep your messes and your wounds, your secrets safe with you behind closed doors. 
truth be told, the truth is rarely told. I say I'm fine, yeah, I'm fine, oh, I'm fine, hey, I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken, and when it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not. And you know it, I don't know why it's so hard to admit it. When being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know. So let the truth be told. There's a sign on the door says, come as you are, but I doubt it. Because if we lived like that was true, every Sunday morning pew would be crowded. But didn't you say church should look more like a hospital? A safe place for the sick, the sinner and the scarred and the prodigals like me. The truth be told, the truth is rarely told. Oh, am I the only one who says I'm fine? Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. Hey, I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken, and when it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not. And you know it. I don't know why it's so hard to admit it when being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know. So let the truth be told. Can I really stand here unashamed, knowing that your love for me won't change? So if that's really true, then let the truth be told. I say I'm fine, yeah, I'm fine, oh, I'm fine, hey, I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken, and when it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not. And you know it, I don't know why it's so hard to admit it, when being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know, I know. There's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know. So let the truth be told. Music and its ministry all on its own. So announcements. The first thing I want to tell you about is a table out in the concourse. And it is our question box. Adult team has been talking a lot about the questions that come. Sometimes Mitch and I will get questions from church members like, what do I really have to believe to be Presbyterian? Or do I really have to believe this or that? Or, man, I really struggle in my faith with uh, prayer. I don't really understand what prayer does because I just don't feel it. These are faith questions. And what we are going to do after Easter is offer a series of Sunday school classes to talk about our faith questions. But we would like to direct these studies to your faith questions. So out in the, um, in the con uh, concourse is a box. And this is an opportunity for you to ask all kinds of questions. One of the things that we really would like to talk about is how history has made changes to Christianity that have become harmful. What did history do to Christianity? That'd be a great question. That would open the door to all kinds of conversations. But put your questions. You don't have to put a name on them, but just write your questions on the paper that are on the table, and then put your questions in the box, and then we're going to take a look at those and um, see what we can build for a series of conversations about faith questions together. Our new members class continues this week and down in room five, which is in the music wing of the building, so in the adult class wing, so make your way down there. It's the last classroom on the right as you are coming from the sanctuary. Um, other events coming up that you can think of? Sunday school is perking along. We hope that you will enjoy that. Fellowship time always after worship in Heartland Hall is a good time for you to gather together and enjoy one another's company. 
There are all kinds of other announcements and activities happening in the life of the church. I really encourage you to read your bulletin and also take a look at uh, midweek announcements in our newsletter. And if you do not receive those digitally, you can contact the church office and Patrick will put you on the email list so that you will receive that information. For me personally, I think that um, fear and anxiety is harder for me to deal with than forgiveness. It's easier for me to forgive the person who has hurt me than it is for me to be without fear. And so I need to let go of some fear. That's my Lenten practice, is to continue to do that. But I think that Jesus recognized, because he experienced it too, that it's not that we won't have fear, and it's not a measure of our faith if we have worry, but it's how we deal with it that is important. And so I would say, if you are someone who may need medication for fear and anxiety, find a doctor. There's no shame in needing to take medication for depression, anxiety, and fear. It's a chemical thing that happens in your brain oftentimes, but you can't control it emotionally or with lofty ideas. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest, and that has been my experience in the midst of my fear. So figure out what works for you. Lent is a time of spiritual practices and thinking about ways of praying, ways of being in the presence of God, whether it's alone or in community. Find that way. And then you can trust that God will be with you. We were trying to name the Holy Spirit and other names the other day. The Holy Spirit, it could be, you could call it your conscience, you can call it whatever it is that stirs inside of you and nudges you. Listen for that voice that can help you to find peace. Because God desires for you to feel love and well-being. And then I'm going to tag on there again because I think Jesus said it so many times. And then do what you can to relieve the fear and anxiety for someone else. So go this week knowing that you are loved, that God desires to hear from you and care for you, and to care for your fears and anxiety. Go in peace. Amen.